Uh, I'd like to talk for just a minute about something I think is really quite important. You know, the word Kundalini is kind of like a everyday term today. Uh, you know, when I was younger, you never heard of the word Kundalini. I mean, it was something very esoteric and nobody ever discussed it. And today people flippantly use the word for, you know, whatever. And uh, I, you know, something happened today, which is very interesting regarding Kundalini. One of my students got an email from somebody telling him about these horrible Kundalini experiences he had when he was younger. You know, something about his brain and, you know, you know, really terrible stuff. And, uh, you know, the student got in touch with me and, and to me, it was, a, it was very indicative of what happens to people when they mess around with Kundalini and they don't have any real training. They, they haven't the capacity, you know, to stay focused in the third chakra where there's the real power and the rootedness that can deal with Kundalini. They never learned how to do it. And yet they mess around with Kundalini. They, they read books, they read about it. And they do exercises that, you know, that are completely outside their control and can create a lot of problems for people. And, uh, and when I read what this guy wrote, uh, it was very indicative of this. I mean, it's one of the reasons why drugs are very dangerous, you know? I mean, drugs activate Kundalini. And they can give you Kundalini experience. They certainly did to me when I was younger, you know, but I had no training. I had no capacity to stay focused. I had no real development of chi inside myself. I had no ability to keep my attention focused below the navel. And I remember those drugs that I did, they almost burned me out alive. You know, uh, they probably would have killed me if I would have continued doing them. But the Kundalini experiences were really powerful. And I must admit, they, admit. Were, they gave me my first insight into how profound spiritual, how profound, how profound spiritual, what's going on, Tony? It looks like it's Chi Core's um, audio is, is echoing. Well, whatever, whoever's doing that, uh, please stop it. You know, uh, it gave me a deep indication of how dangerous drugs were and that I really had to stay away from them because they do waste you. They destroy your inner life. They eat away the cells. They eat away your brain and they activate Kundalini, which is so powerful that it can ream a person out inside unless they have training. And it's why I keep repeating this over and over again. We're dealing with primal forces that are really powerful. Life is very powerful. We need to be rooted in order to deal with our karma, with life, with the complexities of life, the tensions of life, the whole external world, this whole world of Maya, you know, that controls the lives of so many people because they're not focused inside themselves. You know, spirit, God is another energy that is, it's infinite. It's the fountainhead of all creative energy. You know, and when you draw that energy into your system, you know, it can burn you up. It's too strong. You know, it's like, and I always say in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna reveals himself to Arjuna, it's as if the light of a thousand suns suddenly appeared in the sky. This is, you know, not, you know, not kindergarten energy. This is energy of incredible intensity and incredible power. And we need to have the inner strength to deal with all these things. And, the, and then you take Kundalini also, which is a powerful energy. And people putz around with these things. You know, they read a book and they try experimenting with themselves and it's very dangerous. And then you get feedback from people, well, my brain almost burned away. My, you know, I was crippled for 
you know, six months, I, you know, all kinds of crap that comes back from, and then they blame it on Kundalini. They don't blame it on their own stupidity, which is messing with forces of energy that are too strong to mess with unless you have the strength inside yourself to be able to support those experiences. And it's the reason why Rudy taught this meditation from the foundation up. The first thing he ever told me was, get your mind focused, you gotta get your mind focused below the navel. You gotta build that chakra below the navel because that is the source of your power and strength that's gonna enable you to deal with everything that manifests, you know, in the practicing of the meditation that he teaches. So, you know, I hear people talk about all this stuff and it's just, you know, and it's all just lip service bullshit, you know, unless there's really the strength inside to be able to allow the Kundalini experience to truly be a pathway to enlightenment. And that's what it is. And just imagine in your mind how powerful that is. Something that's a pathway to enlightenment. How strong a person has to be in themselves. How grounded they have to be inside themselves in order to really, you know, navigate that pathway or not even navigate, get on that path to enlightenment. So when I got this email today, it was very, you know, I mean, it really brought up a lot of the stuff to me about how people need to learn what they're doing in order to build a system inside that is strong enough to attain a state of enlightenment. And without that kind of an inner life, you know, all these things are too powerful. And I'm not doing this to scare anybody. I'm doing this to tell you how important it is to truly, seriously take the inner work that you have to do on yourself to grow. And if you're seriously interested in spiritual enlightenment, then you got to put in all the stones that will build the pyramid. You don't start from the third eye. You, know? <laughs> you got to start from the base. It has to be a foundation that is built to where the pyramid finally manifests in its completed form. In many ways, we are the pyramids and we have to learn how to build that kind of inner life. So, you know, I'm just saying this because it came up today and really almost just before meditation class, I got this email, maybe a couple hours before meditation class. And I want to relay this to all of you because I can't tell you how significant this is and how important it is to build that pyramid, to build that stupa, the internal stupa, which really becomes, you know, a pathway to enlightenment. brick by brick. <laughs> Don't start with some fantasy about the completed pyramid, you know? It has to go in brick by brick. We have to build ourselves brick by brick. And all the rest of it, honestly, it's just a lot of spacey stuff. And so many people get swept away in all that space cadet kind of spirituality that, uh, you know, I never understood. Even before I met Rudy, I didn't understand that. I knew before I met Rudy, I needed somebody like Rudy. <laughs> I knew this, who could really train me in how to build an inner life that was strong enough to have a spiritual life. I mean, with all the swamis and rishis and rabbis and priests that I used to go to, you know, it was all in search of somebody like Rudy who truly had, you know, the experience, the wisdom, the know-how, you know, to help somebody truly grow and develop a system inside that will enable them to have a spiritual life.
Did, did, I, does anyone have a question you would like to ask? Stuart, I would like to ask a question. Um, I know you probably said it a thousand times, but uh, <laughs> most of the time. One. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, go on. Um, I found it uh, in most of my classes with you or with Eli in, in Israel, I found it hard to keep focus uh, below the navel for more than 10 seconds. Sometimes I do best, I do better. But uh, how do you manage to, I mean, try to stay even more focused because it just implicates my my life after the class. I don't, I don't feel focused as I, as I want to be. Uh, let me ask you a question. You know, I look, I once went to Carnegie Hall to see a piano concert by, uh, I think it was Vladimir Horowitz, the very master of the piano. And he took one finger and hit a note and it filled the entire concert hall. And I said, how does he do that? You know, how does he do it? practice. 20 years of sitting in front of a piano, nine hours a day, <laughs> mastering the piano, mastering the craft of the piano so that one finger could fill the entire music hall. This is no different. And this is even more difficult because we're dealing with the one person you know, who's the most difficult person to master, master on the planet Earth, and that's ourselves. So it takes work, it takes time, it takes discipline, it takes truly mastering oneself to learn how to do what you're asking. It doesn't just come because you take a class, you know, it takes time to and the, the person you need to get past is yourself. The mind, the emotions, the physical tensions, the, all that stuff that distracts us all the time and keeps us from being centered. And as you slowly master your inner life, then it gets clear how to be, you just automatically stay centered there, you know? You, know, you don't have to even, you're just there. <laughs> you, know? you're just, you have mastered the credo. It's like one finger and the whole concert all fills with music. You know, one little breath and you fill with Shakti. But you have to master it. And that's your work. It's my work. It's the everybody's work who's in this class. Learning to master this. And it takes time. Time becomes your, your best friend when you use it consciously. You know, if not, it's like one of your worst enemies, the whole fear of getting old and dying and all of that neurosis that racks the whole chemistry of human beings, you know? It disappears. And with one finger, one breath, right into that Chakra and the whole system just fills up with Shakti. You can arrive at that place. Sometimes I do this class, I take one breath and the whole one deep breath in the whole class. And the class is just resounding with Shakti, energy that's nurturing me and everybody that's in it. It's becoming a master of the craft. I hope that's clear, you know, and then have patience with yourself. It's not going to happen. <laughs> God, you know, I mean, Rudy once told me it takes seven years of studying with a teacher to know whether or not you're on the right path. Seven years, he told me, of studying with a teacher, just to know that. Does anyone else have a question you would like to ask? 
I mean, this is very powerful stuff. And I, I'm not here to intimidate anyone. I'm here to help, hopefully guide everybody into a really, you know, profound use of this meditation to build an inner life. And I've been doing it a very long time and I, I'm still doing it. I'm still using it every day to evolve and to grow. I watched Rudy, who I never met anyone quite like Rudy, the kind of energy he had, using it every day to evolve and to grow. He used to love when students would come into his store and would sit and do his meditation with them. I hope this is clear to all of you, you know, I'm not here to crack a whip. <laughs> I'm here to try and help people, you know, understand that really how profound this is, this thing we do, and then to use it in their life and to have patience with themselves. But you're not going to master this in 50, 40 classes, 20 classes, you know, it takes time. You know, it takes time for a bottle of wine for the bouquet to become delicious. You know, it takes time for an apple to ripen on a tree. You know, it takes time when you're pregnant to have a child. You can't have a child in a month. <laughs> you're not going to have a child. You're going to have a miscarriage. You have to give things the time it takes to evolve, mature, and come into fruition. Stuart, yes. can, can you talk about um, in our e everyday lives when we come across patterns that we want to break, when we find ourselves in the middle of something, besides bringing the awareness to that second chakra, do you do the breathing exercise as well? Well, you know, look, you know, when I come up against, you know, tense and difficult. The first thing that happens, I make sure my mind is below the navel. Because if I'm focused there, I can deal with anything. If I'm in my emotions, if I'm in my head, if I'm in all those tensions, the fear, the anxiety of something, you know, you can't deal with it. But if there's harmony and balance, I mean, look, it's the whole secret of the martial arts. All these guys that flip people around and break bricks with their hand. It's all chi that's doing it. You know, it's all their capacity to stay focused in the hara. And that gives them the ability to be completely in tune with whatever's going on around them. You know, so this is no different. Being focused in the hara enables you to deal with just about anything that will manifest in your life. Once you lose your focus, forget about it, you know? You know, then life will deal with you. And it's almost an impossibility to deal with somebody else's tension unless you scream louder than they do. And then everybody just completely drains themselves of energy, drains themselves dry. So just try that. And yes, we all run into things that are impossible, <laughs> unbelievable, certain kinds of logic in the world that drive everybody crazy and, you know, get centered. You know, absorb it, dissolve it in yourself and don't allow that kind of stuff to suck all your energy out of you. And to be, you know, look, just to be honest about this, you almost need things like this to happen in your life, like you just described, Eva, because we have to be reminded we haven't arrived yet, and there's still more work that we need to do on ourselves. We can't sequester ourselves in little glass houses and think that by protecting ourselves from negative situations, you know, that we're going to grow. We don't. 
by opening and embracing life and allowing many things to come in and teach us, it's just a constant reminder we haven't arrived yet. We still have work to do on ourselves. It's the way God, the universe is teaching us that we still have work to do on ourselves. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? So it used to drive me crazy when I was younger, when I was running that ashram in Texas, you know, watching people hiding out in these situations, right? And, and when I moved back to New York, I said, I'll never do that again, ever. People come, there's meditation, and they go home. And they have to deal with and build their lives. You know, and not use the meditation as a kind of womb in which they can hide out. And people do this, you know, all the time in many different ways. They're looking for safety zones that they can live in that protect them against life. And all they're doing is damage to themselves, you know? Setting up little guardrails around them to keep life out. You know, it doesn't work. Life always comes in, no matter where you are, what you're doing. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question, Stuart, because I was going to ask something about the, like the intensity of the more intense challenge or uh, like sometimes very simple. I could take one breath in and be down in the one point. And then there are times when it's so intense. So you say it's we have more work to do is the answer. Um, but is there a difference or something about that very intense where it's almost unbearable or unable to get well, look wendy there are things in life that happen to us that remind us we're not quite ready for these things so you know a good general knows how to retreat retreat i'm not ready for this okay i got to get stronger to be able to deal with that kind of intensity you know I mean, I used to have this, in, when I first started out my business in Texas, I was buying, you know, you know, antique wrenches and wagon wheels and selling things for $10 and, you know, $20, you know, and slowly it worked up to where, you know, things that used to intimidate, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, I was intimidated by back then, no longer intimidated me. I worked up to it where it became just part of the day. You know, part of doing my life. You, know, you understand? But if I would have, when I first started out, tried to buy something that, you know, it would have freaked me out. I would have gone running to the hills. I said, Stuart, back off and do what you can do and grow and get more open to the ability to do bigger things and more intense things in life. You understand what I'm saying? So very helpful. I'll repeat it. A good general knows when to retreat. You know, we know, sometimes have to retreat. Back off. I'm not ready for this yet. I will get stronger and one day I will be ready for this. You know? Does anyone else have a question? I would like to ask. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> There'll be class tomorrow evening. <laughs> I hope you all show up and God bless you all. And, I, and again, as I always end these calls, in all humility, thank you.
these classes you, are major steps in my life, and I hopefully they're steps in your life. So God bless you all, and and uh, and thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Thank Good you. night. Good night. Wonderful. Thank you, Stuart.